Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to Episode 5 of Let's Talk ETC. I'm your host, Carlo V, along with my co-host, Dr. Christian Severino. I want to thank the ETC devs, investors, miners, users, and other community members for another great week. Uh, For those of you watching on YouTube, the ETC newsletter that was just released today will be in the description below. Uh, So that's anyone watching on YouTube, you can find the link to that newsletter. Uh, Also, in this newsletter, we've got really big news. Uh, Now, I don't have all the details yet, but Charles Hoskinson and IOHK uh, are bringing a new team on board and committing them to Ethereum Classic. The team is called the Grotendieck team. Uh, They're named after Alexander Grotendieck, who was a mathematician that became a leading figure in the creation of modern algebraic geometry. I'll have more details on this as soon as uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be introducing them, uh, the whole team to the Cole community pretty soon. So as soon as I have all the details, I'll definitely be letting you guys know. Also, if you guys have cool ideas about how the community can receive updates from the devs, uh, please let me know either on Reddit or on Slack or, you know, however you can let us know, even in the YouTube comments below. And I'll try to communicate that with the dev team and with other people involved so that we can get some really cool uh, updating features for what these guys are up to and um, just everything that they're going to be contributing towards the Ethereum Classic platform. So uh, also we have the monetary policy by Snaproll, which is still in there for anyone who wants to check that out. Um, There's another reminder in there about the ETC event in London, which has been organized by Dr. Av Tarsera. It's going to be taking place next week on December 13th at 6 p.m. I'm actually going to be over there, guys, so I'm going to do my best to uh, do a live broadcast from that event. I'll let you guys know whether that, uh, how that goes, and I'll give you more details about that later. Uh, so check out the, the newsletter for details on the event. Um, there's a Twitter post from Avtar and a link to the meetup group for uh, all the details that concern that event. Also, there's an article uh, uh, titled Fermat Distributed Governance Model by uh, Louis Molina. And we have another article from Dr. Severino about interplanetary file systems, IPFS, uh, for any of you guys that are interested in that. So, um, yeah, very cool stuff, especially the new team joining the project. Now, on to the main focus of the show tonight. Uh, We have a, a community member from the ETC Investment. Uh, community that's going to be joining us. We have a really great guest. Uh, he's extremely knowledgeable and has provided a ton of great insight on Slack many, many, many times. He's also got some news for us about the recent meetup with Barry Silbert and Digital Currency Group. Uh, special guest with us tonight, Jerry. Jerry, how are you? Thanks for coming on. I'm good, Carla. Thanks. Excellent, excellent. So, um, you know, something we've been doing just for people when it's their first time on the show, we kind of just get, uh, you know, kind of their background, how they got into blockchain and what interests them and ETC and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I guess what kind of got you into blockchain and kind of that whole history and stuff like that, just so the audience, you know, kind of gets to know you and stuff like that. And maybe in the future, we'll, we'll we'd love to have you back on again. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, I started uh, investing in Bitcoin around 2015 uh, and it was really uh, fortunate timing because uh, Bitcoin was kind of at the nadir of its popularity at that time. But I became really interested in YouTube videos that I found online that talked about the kinds of uh, unique uh, political properties of the governance model of the Bitcoin blockchain. So I'm guessing that uh, probably both you guys are familiar with the movies that I were watching. Uh, I saw videos by Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, yeah. Stefan Molyneux, uh, Eric Voorhees. Um, I think those were the most influential. Have you both checked out any of those uh, on YouTube? Definitely. Yeah. So from an intellectual standpoint, I found that really fascinating. Um, as for blockchain, uh, you know, it's a confluence of various areas. Uh, the technology is interesting, uh, from a historical perspective, it's fascinating. Uh, of course, uh, the finance is uh, very interesting. 
So it just provides a lot of food for thought, and that was the primary motivation in my uh, participating as an investor. And because I got in at the right moment, I was able to use uh, the profits from my Bitcoin investment to then invest in Ethereum, which I found to be uh, a really fascinating technology, the idea of having these smart contracts and these decentralized organizations. <clears throat> Around the time of the DAO, uh, I started feeling wary about the centralization of the Ethereum governance model. And uh, I was really uh, influenced uh, to a degree by what I read um, on Barry Silbert's feed. So um, that's part of what got me interested in Ethereum Classic from an investor standpoint. And it was a really good experience for me to be able to see uh, Barry Silbert and Melton Demerors, a digital currency group in person at this meetup in Singapore. And uh, I found it really- That's uh, awesome. And yeah. I'm um, sorry, continue. Sorry about that. No, I was just saying that, um, you know, you go on YouTube and you have access to all of these incredibly fascinating videos. And I'd really be interested in hearing what kinds of talks or presentations or content uh, you found online that, that you've felt to be um, uh, inspiring uh, or um, gave you kind of a better understanding of the unique, uniqueness of blockchain technology. Um, I find that in person when I attend meetups for uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, that it can tend to be disappointing if I compare it with, you know, the level of engagement that I have when listening to, you know, Andreas um, on a YouTube video. But this particular meetup I found to be uh, really engaging and um, if you're in uh, Asia or if you're in Southeast Asia, um, you know, you should really check out Singapore. It's a very interesting hub for financial technology. And uh, Zach has this blockchain startup Singapore meetup there. It's really worth attending. And I think this because of the uh, featured speakers, uh, this particular event, uh, I just found it uh, very rewarding. So how, no, absolutely. How like, oh, go ahead, Christian. How, uh, how do you, um, like, what's your, how do you like helping people? What do you help people with in the community? Oh, hey, Christian. Well, I like that Ethereum Classic is an open platform. So mm -hmm. what I like to do is volunteer my time to reach out to other investors and see if maybe we can come to some consensus on our objectives as a group. Because okay. in my view, <clears throat> Ethereum Classic is composed of three camps primarily, three constituencies that have differing objectives. And it's very natural that they should have differing objectives. Those groups being the miners, the developers, and the investors. So I think in order to decentralize the platform and to negotiate uh, about what we want to see in upcoming ECIPs, it's really our responsibility that we convene among ourselves, get some consensus about what our objectives are, and then negotiate with the other constituencies going forward instead of engaging in uh, coercion or ad hominem attacks to get our way. Okay. okay. 100%. Do you also see yourself as trying to bring in more capital into the community and, and grow the pie? Is that kind of trying to convince people to invest in ETC? Well, something that I feel I'm capable of doing is arguing against people who I feel are um, attempting to sabotage investor confidence. Okay. I have a degree of confidence in Ethereum Classic as a long-term store of value. So uh, when I see arguments being made <clears throat> that I view as being irrational or illogical, because these are happening on social networks that are um, uh, interactive, I can you know, uh, reply 
to certain statements that are being made. So that's a way where I, as an investor, can help in um, protecting the sure, market value sure. of Ethereum Classic is to hold in favor of its long-term usage. Okay. Um, so you don't work with Barry Silbert, but uh, you just have a high regard for him and you've met him, as you said. Um, no, I'm an independent party. Okay. Yeah, I had a question for people that um, aren't big investors that are listening. So it might seem like this black magic and mysterious thing that you guys do. And I, I remember personally, um, Barry Silbert started getting bullish on ETC and he, he made a big investment and he was one of the early proponents of it. And um, I remember thinking, you know, that's impressive that he's sticking his neck out like that with his money. And, yeah, um, and I it agree. was impressive that he's so confident and he, I guess he has his method of analyses. And, um, but uh, I don't know if everybody would have the confidence to stick their neck out with the new technology like he did. Can you say something about how you guys operate and why you can be so confident with my money that way? Well, again, I'm an independent party. Uh, I'm part of the Ethereum Classic community, and I'm volunteering my time as an investor to put out information that I believe is backed up by reason and evidence. I don't have the credentials mm -hmm. that uh, Barry Silbert and Melton Demerors and the Digital Currency Group have, but I think that it is useful for me to appear on this podcast in a way in order to invite other people who might be reticent, who might feel like, oh, well, who am I to participate? Oh, no. in this community? I, I've, uh, for anybody listening out there, I've seen uh, Jerry, uh, you know, speak on numerous occasions on Slack, you know, even on Twitter, on multiple different channels, and uh, his insight is always awesome, and uh, his rebuttals are always great. So uh, I, I know Slack, they, they get deleted after 10,000 messages. I wish they didn't because there's a lot of great ones in there. <laughs> you know? So yes, I understand what you're saying. So you can't speak for Barry. Um, you have your, you're an independent, as you said. Um, but still, you analyze the technology, and you were able to get yourself to a, a point where you were confident enough to, to invest. And um, that the investing, I think, might be scary for a lot of people. So. Um, yeah, you know, you don't need to necessarily invest monetarily. Um, if you feel that uh, you're not in a position to uh, do that, you can always invest your time and energy, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you like the ideology of Ethereum Classic, you can invest in doing research and then posting a blog, or you can invest in uh, doing an interview with someone in the community. Or if yeah. you have an arts background, you know, you can put uh, new uh, ideas for logos or marketing material or, or some kind of documentary out there. I mean, yeah. it's really an open platform in the sense of open source where it's not a kind of closed pr proprietary corporate environment. It's something where, you know, on the uh, order of uh, Wikipedia, anyone can come forward as long as what they're bringing is deemed by the community to be of value, um, you know, you're going to be welcomed, especially at this point because we're so early on yeah. in the life of Ethereum Classic. It's, it's a fortunate moment. And I think that's why, as you were saying, Christian, um, Barry did stick his neck out because some people are low risk, uh, mm -hmm. some people are high risk. I think that Digital Currency Group likes the idea of getting in on a certain uh, technology, certain cryptocurrency early in the game. If they are sufficiently convinced that the fundamentals are there, uh, taking those risks is what separates you from your competitors, right? So long yeah. as you have the foresight to see what's going to happen down the road, uh, taking those risks is what makes the reward possible. Yeah. Now um, that you just, I just thought of another question. Speaking of mm -hmm. the how you guys operate, um, now as the like you said, you invested in Bitcoin, and you know how every price goes up and down in cryptocurrencies. How do you guys keep from not you know raising your blood pressure checking the price every day and, and obsessing over little changes yeah crypto is a crazy place <laughs> by you guys you mean uh, investors in general yes yes okay 
Um, I, I just want to reiterate that uh, I don't want to um, have people misled into thinking that I'm uh, speaking for Digital Currency Group. You know, I'm I'm an uh -huh. enthusiast that yeah. attends. No, no, I, I think um, I think Christian Moore meant like looking inside right. the mind of the because we have a lot of people that listen on here that are maybe just devs or maybe just users. Yeah. So it's a good question. Yeah, I, I think you can at least give us some insight maybe into your investment related mind and right. other people can extrapolate their own ideas about how other investors think, you know? So to me, what made Bitcoin valuable was that um, it was a venue for uh, anarcho-capitalism. Um, it was an experimental venue where you could engage in anarcho-capitalism, which was previously in human history not possible. Uh, because within the venue of Bitcoin, there's no state intervention. Of course, outside of it, there is the intervention of the state, which is necessary because we rely upon the state to protect us against criminality. Within the venue, within the purview of Bitcoin, we can do peer-to-peer -peer transactions without there being an authority figure to... Um, uh, mediate over them because you have the blockchain. It's a trustless technology yes. that allows for people Very to true. transact with each other without there needing to be an authority figure other than this um, public ledger and this technology that Satoshi created. Yes, and it's it's a work in progress. It's an experiment in progress. All this blockchain technology is fairly new and when you hear about the the block size debate in Bitcoin land, or you have uh, a bunch of money in Ethereum, uh, and then you hear about the DAO attack. These things don't um, make you lose sleep at night, thinking, "Oh my gosh, what, maybe I got in too early, or maybe made a mistake." No, it's a very good question about blood pressure. There are <laughs> ways that you can mitigate against risk, right? You don't have to go all in on Bitcoin. Um, if you're kind of an ideological fanatic, you might be uh, influenced to go in that direction. But of course, the rejoinder is that if you put too much of your capital into Bitcoin at the wrong time, uh, you're going to regret it, right? Like if you had invested when Bitcoin was at $1,000 uh, several years ago, that was obviously bad timing if you want to preserve your capital. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can follow the markets and you can be uh, as risky as you feel matches your situation. Right. I mean, you can determine what percentage of your portfolio you put into a more stable blockchain token like Bitcoin mm -hmm. and what percentage you want to risk on a more volatile and uncertain blockchain like Ethereum Classic. So if you feel that your blood pressure is suffering, your sleep cycles are suffering, you can always mitigate the risk by um, lowering the percentage of uh, your involvement in one given cryptocurrency or another. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that's, I think good, that's good advice. I think that's good advice overall, too. Uh, if you want to play a little bit safe, have most of your money in conservative investments and then have a small portion that you say, okay, this is this is for more higher risk investments, and I can, I, I I'm intentionally, willingly, consciously taking risks, and I know that this is higher risk, and so I'm okay with that. And oh, then, also for everyone listening out there, dollar cost averaging is your friend. If you're if you're just getting into this and nervous about uh, putting anything in in any particular place, dollar cost averaging, very good. And, you know, this is really about investing in a technology. So if you find that you're making certain sacrifices, uh, that might be the way that you contribute to the community, right? For me, I've made profits off of Bitcoin. I've made profits off of Ethereum. I'm ideologically invested in Ethereum Classic. So being involved during this volatile price discovery uh, era of Ethereum Classic's life cycle, um, you have to be open because it's so risky to making sacrifices for the benefit of the community. 
that's a way in which investors participate, right, as one of these three constituencies that is often overlooked by the other camps. And that's why, like I said, it's really important that we negotiate with each other and rec recognize the value of each other's um, contributions rather than engaging in shortcuts like coercion and, and ad hominem attacks. And I find that yeah. investors in particular are kind of easy targets because it's so easy to um, dismiss investors as being concerned with the monetary gains and not in the more um, kind of, uh, um, you know, political or technological or, yeah. or, or the, um, those other elements uh, that are more idealistic, um, arguably. There's, there's definitely a sweet spot to, uh, you know, come to terms with what would work for all three parties and what would, you know, make the best combination of features for the platform going forward into the future. I, I think I'm, I'm pretty happy with the direction that things are, are going currently, you know? Yeah. Can, um, I, also, I, I, I wanted I to ask you, what, what, Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. A conservative way of doing it is um, you start by investing very little. And if you find that you make gains using the profits to engage in, in riskier um, investments, that way all you're risking are your profits, right? You, you don't want to cut into uh, the capital that you have saved up for, you know, important uh, other uses. I see. Gotcha. Um, I had a question. Um, since you mentioned about defending the reputation of ETC uh, in the investor community, do you have any funny stories or maybe not so funny stories of, of kind of verbal altercations or things you had to do to protect ETC? Well, you know, when I mentioned that I view Bitcoin as an anarcho-capitalist platform, we, I think, generally understand what is meant by capitalism. Maybe half the U.S. population believes that capitalism and property rights are uh, ideal and allow for a free society. Maybe Isn't half crazy? are more skeptical, you know, and would prefer, mm -hmm. you know, some other model. But the anarcho part is elusive because in our vernacular, uh, anarchy has come to mean no rules. So you're setting bonfires in garbage cans and you're yeah. shaving off all of your hair and you're tipping cows over. That, that's what people think of in terms of anarchy. In the historical sense, anarchy means uh, no rulers. Mm -hmm. So when I see uh, people kind of asserting their authority in ways that I think are irrational or illogical, that's when I tend to kind of fire back or push back. So <clears throat> an example of this that I find interesting is if you had visited the New York Times the day before the presidential election, there was a little widget on the page that showed the likelihood of one or the other candidate winning the election. Yeah, I remember did that. You, did you check out that, uh, that widget? Uh, I heard about it, but I wasn't... Uh paying attention to it the day before the election. The day before the election when that widget appeared, the New York Times gave Hillary Clinton something like 90% likelihood of being the next president of the United States. Yeah. So if you had gone by the authority of the New York Times as a reputable um, and non-biased institution uh, of uh, intrepid fact gatherers that were never going to be biased one way or another, and we're simply going to record the facts. They got it astonishingly wrong. Uh, yeah. There was something going on there with confirmation bias. So what I resonate with in terms of anarcho-capitalism as a concept is the idea that the blockchain can give you an accurate view of the world that you can rely upon in place of a trusted third party, in place of an authority figure like, in this instance, the New York Times widget that just got the facts phenomenally wrong, right, mm -hmm. and were phenomenally biased. So 
basically, I don't come forward uh, trying to convince people that I have credentials such that they can turn their skepticism off. I come forward with ideas, information that I think is backed up by uh, reason and evidence. And that way I can communicate with people on an even playing field and we can have a logical, reasonable argument. Mm -hmm. But what I see so much in the crypto sphere is that there are people with um, some degree of authority that is propped up by some institution or the other and they put out information that is, uh, or arguments that are irrational or illogical, you know, on Twitter or Reddit. And the reason they do this is because they are invested in one cryptocurrency or another. Yeah, it, it's like they, they might not necessarily be such biased people, but once they're so heavily invested in something, it's hard to turn off the bias, you know? And they're relying on the bias, just as the New York Times was relying on the incredulity of the readers to believe right. that Hillary Clinton had this massive, uh, you know, advantage that didn't actually exist. So you really need to be skeptical. You really need to rely upon your own ability to distinguish fact from fiction. And what I like about Ethereum Classic is that as an open platform, it invites everyone equally equally to be involved, and then the community determines who is contributing and who is looking to subvert the well-being of the network. And there are definitely many people out there who hold tokens of other blockchains who are making a not-so-subtle attempt to subvert the Ethereum Classic community. If you jump on the on the Reddit and check out some of the comments, it, it becomes evident that not everyone on the Reddit wants for uh, Ethereum Classic to have a bright future. That, that's just the inevitable consequences of a capitalist platform where we have um, competition between blockchains. Yeah, I could imagine, um, just you got me thinking, I could imagine, let's say there was hypothetically somebody had invested uh, 100,000 or more in uh, Ethereum, the forked version, I could imagine them being threatened by you and people like you investing in Ethereum Classic and anything to do with a competitor like Ethereum Classic that I could see them going on the defensive and or the, on a, the attack rather. And it's, it's nothing personal against you. It's just that they're feeling threatened, right? Because they have so much invested in, in the competitor. Yeah, there's a lot at stake. And, you know, uh, I was an Ethereum investor. So I met a lot of people during that time. I made friends. And um, so I try to be as, uh, you know, cordial and polite as possible when I'm talking with people who I used to uh, associate with. Um, but there is a lot of animosity, you know, back and forth between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. What made me reluctant to continue supporting Ethereum is that like I mentioned a couple times before, I see Bitcoin and its orientation being this experiment in anarcho-capitalism where the blockchain substitutes for the state within state power and authority within a small sphere uh, of your life, right? You've still got the state to protect you against criminality outside of the blockchain. Within the blockchain, there are certain things that you can do that don't require an authority figure. And that's what makes it anarcho-capitalist in, um, in its flavor. Sure. And uh, so that I view as being very interesting, very valuable. And I saw the steps that Ethereum was taking toward greater centralization and basically establishing the Ethereum Foundation as a trusted third party that would mediate uh, and decide which transactions were valid and which were not. That bothered me in terms of what, what I saw as being truly revolutionary about Satoshi's vision. Not yeah, that was kind of weird, that, what, the, what they did, right? <laughs> well, not <laughs> everyone it. <laughs> in Ethereum values Satoshi's vision. So it's important to recognize that. There's a lot of trash talking about Satoshi within Ethereum, not, not everyone, but certain people. And so that's where 
one can draw the distinction. One can say, I support Ethereum Classic because I see the community taking steps to bring it in line with the model provided by Bitcoin. And I see there being too many steps being taken by Ethereum that put it more in line with legacy financial institutions and governance models. Yeah. I have a, I have a quick question actually uh, about especially not, not just how Ethereum Classic deviated from Ethereum in respect to principles of immutability, but even the steps we're taking with regard to like monetary policy, what were a lot of the, the what's your sentiment or investor sentiment on how they're handling that with the kind of question mark inflation schedule and stuff like that. Cause I've, okay. I've never really had, you know, a lengthy discussion with a big investor about Ethereum and, and stuff like that. Well, again, uh, I don't want to position myself as a big investor because I think that, um, you know, uh, well, no, no, I, I just mean people. like, uh, what you're thinking or how they're, how you right. think you're thinking, no, you know, just general sentiment. It's a good question. I'm nit nitpicking a bit because I don't want for people to turn off their skepticism when listening to me. So I, I view myself as uh, a little, a little investor, uh, an everyman. And uh, if I can be of some use to the community, then so can you. Um, it's a very good question. Um, to get back to an earlier question that Christian uh, asked about um, pushing back against remarks that I view as uh, illogical. Um, there was a tweet that was posted by a Cornell professor saying that if Ethereum Classic, the community, and I'm paraphrasing, were to take the steps to solve the monetary policy issues that Classic inherited from Vitalik's design, that this would be a violation of the Ethereum contract. I don't know if you've seen this tweet. He, 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 he can't be serious. I honestly think all his posts are satire. I, I, it has to be a joke. <laughs> I know you're talking about that Ermin Van whatever, I don't know, right? Well, I don't want to name names because I'm being critical. I'll name it, I'll name it. It's that Ermin Van whatever, uh, <laughs> I would say that for anyone listening, I would say that I'd post his Twitter in the description below, but I don't want you guys to uh, blow it up. So uh, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, he, he's got some pretty uh, funny tweets to, to say the least. The way I like to do it is that I, I like to name names when I'm congratulating people and I'm a little more reticent when it comes to naming names when I think that there are mistakes that are being made. So when I talk about Vitalik, my feeling is that he created a technology that I value, and I want to see that technology preserved. And if Ethereum Classic is successful, I think Vitalik as a technologist will be vindicated. Uh, I think that he's maybe not the best as a politician, um, which is a pretty good yeah. trade-off to make. I mean, I would rather be a successful technologist than a successful politician. And we don't really know, we don't really know how things will play out, but getting back to this tweet, it was posted by a Cornell professor. So when you visit his page, you are biased in favor of believing what he's saying. You think this is an intellectual, he's rational, he's um, you know, uh, got the facts and finger, figures at his fingers. But yeah. I, I really wanna break down this tweet because he says that Ethereum Classic fixing this issue of the inflationary monetary supply, which is in conflict with Satoshi's original vision of a cryptocurrency that is deflationary in nature. Yeah. Now, what does he mean by it's a violation of the contract? I mean, to me, it sounds very <clears throat> reminiscent of what people talk about when they say the power of the state is authorized through the social contract. Well, did you ever sign a contract? Did I ever sign a contract? No, nobody signed the social contract. The social contract is signed uh, when you are born into a given nationality. And if you don't like the contract, you leave the nation. And I think a similar kind of mindset, unless, I mean, when he says contract, you don't know what, if he's talking about a social contract, a smart contract, 
he, well, yeah. I think uh, I, I've read I've read some of his uh, debates on there where people have gotten into it with him. So what I think he meant by that is his his big thing with the Ethereum Classic community and what he likes to bring up um, pretty much all the time is that any change we make, if it's a protocol improvement or a bug fix, he likes to use our 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 debate against us, so to speak. Like because we had uh, a difference of opinion with Ethereum uh, reversing a transaction and altering the blockchain, so now he takes that uh, objection that the Ethereum Classic community has, and he uses it for anything that Ethereum Classic does. If we fix a bug, if we uh, do a protocol improvement, if we fork to to move away from the bomb, or you know whatever it is, he'll post something and say, "See, they they changed the code." They're not immutable. Um, at, at least that's that's what I think his main uh, talking point is every single time that I've seen. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that any transactions on the Ethereum Classic blockchain are a violation of the contract because uh, <laughs> you know you're you're adding new blocks to the blockchain, and essentially what it breaks down to when I view it, what I see it as conspicuously, is an argument that if you are competing with Ethereum. If Ethereum Classic is, is competing with Ethereum, that's unfair. If you update the platform so that it's in a, in a position where it's capable of surviving, that's unfair. And basically, unfair means, uh, you know, I have some kind of phil philosophical idea of a contract, you're violating this idea that's in my head, and therefore it, it's, it's unacceptable. But what it boils down to is that Basically, someone with that degree of status should not be making irrational, irrational, illogical arguments. It's up to us as a community to determine what we view as being the best governance model for Ethereum Classic. And the Ethereum Foundation has their own separate blockchain where they can do a, a separate instantiation of a, Ethereum that prizes... Um, mutability Agreed. and centralization of governance. So, you know, I, I dislike it because if there's someone with that degree of social standing who's using irrational arguments for, you know, biased reasons, I think it's out of self-interest because uh, this person holds Ethereum forked tokens. It just goes back to that earlier example of the New York Times having this wildly wrong widget on their page. Uh, we need to be uh, more skeptical and we need to look at the arguments separate from the authority of the person who's making those arguments. True. I think, yeah, I think that's good advice and that's, I'm not a, I'm not a professional trader, but I assume that that's probably, uh, you know, fundamental advice to rely on, on facts, on data, not emotion, not uh, name recognition, superstars, and, and just go by everything they say is gospel, right? Well, oh, Jerry, I'm, sorry, go ahead. I'm not a professional trader. I'm uh -huh. an investor. If you're a trader today, you might be an Ethereum Classic, and tomorrow maybe you've uh, sold your tokens for a profit. Um, so you're an investor one day and not an investor the next. Uh, I'm an enthusiast. Barry Silbert is an expert. You know, where we are aligned ideologically is we both uh, determined that we would buy and hold our mm -hmm. token in order yeah. to create value so that when the miners mine the blockchain, that they're rewarded with a token that people have already invested capital into. Um, Jerry, what... Uh Pre-DAO, pre-DAO yeah. fork, pre-DAO mess, pre-DAO debacle, whatever, however you want to say it. What were your thoughts when things were still uh, everything great in Ethereum land? What were your thoughts on the inflation schedule and the cap and the no cap and stuff like that and point at proof of stake? What were your thoughts on that before kind of that whole mess started? Well, I thought that it was risky to uh, transition from proof of work to proof of stake. And since then, I've looked into it more thoroughly. And, uh, you know, I'm on the same page as Charles Hoskinson, which is that 
if you have a system for proof of stake that is uh, untested uh, and the entire community is dependent upon Casper working the way it's supposed to work without any flaws, it's tremendously risky. The transition is tremendously risky. Casper is necessary, proof of stake is necessary in order to correct the inflationary model of Ethereum. So Ethereum is eventually intending to transition into a deflationary model, but right now it's inflationary. It's the same is true of Zcash. Zcash will one day transition into a deflationary model. Right now it's highly inflationary. So to me, um, I was always interested in the Ethereum technology. I found the smart contracts platform to right. be visionary and exciting, but there was always that risk. And when the DAO uh, fiasco occurred, what that convinced me was that I could not properly trust the Ethereum foundation as a centralized authority, as a centralized entity to pull off Casper uh, to pull off the transition to proof of stake without any issues. And that's been um, supplemented by more recent uh, problems, you know, such as the accidental hard fork where the parity and geth chains uh, didn't quite match up. And when there are these kinds of issues happening, you know, you can... Um, you can understand that it's a highly complex, highly difficult problem to solve. But when you have looming this transition to proof of stake where so much is riding on a smooth transition, the precedent of the DAO is highly disconcerting. Sure. Right. It's like, uh, it's like a bunch of red flags leading up to a bigger red flag, you know? Well, I don't know whether they'll be able to pull it off without um, a hitch. Right. But the fact that it's untested is, uh, is, a, is a problem. And with Ethereum Classic, <clears throat> basically the decision was made that we would fix the monetary policy issue. We would fix the inflationary uh, monetary policy uh, through the implementation of a reining in of the block reward and a cap on the overall issuance of the tokens so that you never have, in terms of snap rules vision of the ECIP, you never have more than about 200 million Ethereum Classic tokens. This brings Ethereum Classic in line with the vision of Satoshi Nakamoto in a way that I find uh, highly uh, valuable because I've seen what's... Uh, been accomplished with Bitcoin, if we can have the same kind of monetary policy attached to this exciting smart contracts platform technology, then Bitcoin and Ethereum Classic can operate side by side and, and complement each other because they're based on the same uh, prevailing ideology. I view it, Ethereum as having violated too many of the tenets of Satoshi Nakamoto in ways that, you know, I myself view as very conspicuous. It's up to each of the Ethereum um, community supporters to determine for themselves whether the Dow contentious hard fork was a bailout. Uh, I view it that way. And uh, I look at the Genesis block of the Bitcoin blockchain and I'm reminded of what is, uh, etched there, you know, um, the, uh, the statement in the Genesis block is uh, Chancellor on verge of second bailout of banks. You're aware of this uh, yes. message in the yep. Genesis block? Very libertarian principles, absolutely. And so when you have an authority in Ethereum that's able to engage in not only printing up new fiat currency, but essentially due to the contentiousness of the hard fork doubling the number of Ethereum tokens, right? And yeah. using, using the new tokens to uh, reward the DAO investors who were incredulous enough to invest in a smart contract platform that had 
a flaw that a hacker was able to exploit, um, that to me is basically reverting back to earlier uh, historical precedents where trusted third parties are used in place of the uh, trustlessness of the blockchain. So Satoshi's saying here in the Genesis block, I view it as his saying that this is his reason for creating Bitcoin, is that he is concerned about the inflationary aspect of fiat currency, and he's concerned that if you authorize uh, a few people to print up as much money as they want, that this becomes habitual, right? It says in the, it says in the Genesis block, the second bailout, right? So it's not unprecedented. And absolutely, if you look at the videos by Andreas Antonopoulos, Andreas frequently talks about money printing as being a kind of a drug addiction. That once you're given that authority, it's such a thrill that you get off on it. And then when you okay. encounter problems, yeah. you have a ready-made solution. You just print up more fiat, right? Can I uh, make a comment about that? Uh, tell me if you agree or disagree. But to, to be fair to the Ethereum forked version, so it's not equivalent to uh, the Federal Reserve where you have a bunch of people that sit around and they could they could turn the spigot right uh, as much print as much money as they want or it's 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 they have a set uh policy in place for how much the money supply increases at what rate it increases so in that sense it's not uh, it's i don't think it's 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 completely accurate to say it's it's like the federal reserve would you agree with that well the similarities are that the federal reserve has no cap on the number of dollars that it can print bitcoin has a 21 million cap mm -hmm. Um, and Ethereum Classic at this time has no cap. It has no, uh, nothing like the halving of the block reward. And so these steps need to be taken because this is uh, going to be fixed according to uh, the Ethereum Foundation by the transition to proof of stake, but we don't know if it'll be successful and we don't know when it'll happen. So this might be a good time to quote uh, Barry Silbert at the meetup um, because he spoke on this issue. Um, but getting back just momentarily as an aside, I would really um, like to recommend to listeners to listen to Andreas Antonopoulos's views on the addictive properties of money printing. And I think if you give people the authority to make these kinds of steps, to uh, alter the monetary supply, that it's very dangerous. So the entire uh, reason for having the blockchain was to have a decentralized, trustless uh, system. So in terms of uh, what Barry Silbert said at this meetup, um, he's talking about meeting with institutional investors, okay, and he's saying, he's capable of arguing in favor of the monetary policy of Bitcoin to some investors. You have to recognize these people are very conservative. They're, they're much less impulsive than people right, right. who are uh, right, putting money into the Dow. Okay, here's a direct quote from Barry Silbert from the meetup. Um, the Dow, he says, and here's the quote, that was, to me, the final nail in the coffin of the Ethereum investment base, Silbert says. You have to understand that I spend easily 25% of my time with institutional investors and hedge funds explaining to them the Bitcoin supply dynamic. Everybody knows it's 21 million and the growth is fixed. The idea that five individuals could unilaterally make a decision to fork Ethereum, in my opinion, out of self-interest, meant that we were never going to see Ethereum successful as an investment asset class. Yeah, that's a pretty telling quote, I'd say. <laughs> so the idea with Ethereum Classic is that we depart from this centralized governance model that Ethereum is relying upon. 
We take it slow. Instead of going fast and breaking things, we try to decentralize the process as much as possible so you don't have authority centralized in the hands of a few people who can make uh, you know, contentious decisions. Uh, instead, you have negotiation and checks and balances between miners, developers, and investors more generally. Can I make Let a me, comment? Um, um, so I think... I think that I think that it's wise to have a cap to the supply. I think that's easy for people to understand. But um, just in it, again, just in fairness to the Ethereum, the fourth version, I think, and their their argument is so they're they're increasing the money supply at a constant rate, but because the total amount of money is constantly growing, uh, it, it like way in the future. The money supply will be much bigger, and so that constant rate of increase will become more and more uh, insignificant. See what I'm saying? The it, the the rate that that the money that's added becomes more and more uh, it becomes less significant as the total supply increases. Now that they not, also recognize the the need for the transition to to proof of stake in order to rein in the inflationary. Monetary. Yeah, proof of stake is a whole another another. Uh, you know, issue, but I mean, that, that's it's not, it's not I, really another issue because the transition to proof of stake uh, will allow for a deflationary uh, monetary policy. Okay. So, so it, it is the necessary step to take in order to okay. bring Ethereum in line with, otherwise you just have quantitative easing on the blockchain. I, I don't see the, any point in doing that. If, yeah. if you agree with the vision of Satoshi Nakamoto that this is, this is a way of providing value that fiat currency cannot do because those who are in authority to print up money in fiat currency, they can't resist. Yeah. <laughs> they print up too much. So Ethereum prints up too much as well. The way that they are going to solve this problem is through the pr transition to uh, proof of stake. We don't want to have, uh, you know, um, uh, digital fiat. We want to have digital gold. Uh, that is something that people can use as a store of value. Um, and it's especially evident now that we need it, now that uh, governments like the Indian government are taking high denomination physical cash uh, out of circulation. Yeah. Also, the other side of the coin for that... Uh, Christian is so let, let's just say if you took the the idea that okay it's a steady inflation rate so things are okay even with that line of thinking there are a lot of people out there who still don't feel comfortable with the steady inflation rate just for inflation rate sake because there's always that fear that after the centralization and the reversal of, of the Dow there is the fear that in the future that centralization can lead to, oh, well, let's just up the inflation rate or let's just create, you know, uh, we could create 100 million out of thin air if we wanted to. Sure. You know, there, there still is that threat if there, there is that centralization of the platform, which yes. it seems like there is at I the agree. moment. And how inflationary was the contentious hard fork? You doubled the money supply overnight. This was obviously not the intention, but um, neither was the DAO hack. That was not the intention of the DAO. When you have over-centralization, when you have uh, an authority figure that is signing off as curators on the DAO, right? you had the Ethereum Foundation stepping forward to vouch for the DAO and saying, hey guys, we've checked out the smart contract, we're uh, signing on as curators, and then not placing any cap on the money invested into the DAO. That to, to me is symptomatic of over-centralization of the governance model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jerry, I wanted to know what are, since we're talking about you know inflation and fiat and governance, gold, all this stuff, what are your thoughts about um, hyperinflation and you know stuff like what happened in Zimbabwe? I guess that's uh, in reference to your analogy earlier about uh, print money printing being like drugs, you know, the in hyperinflationary depression is almost like an overdose, I guess, right? 
Yeah, I mean, that's what's happening now in Venezuela as we speak, right? It's yeah. crazy. They're, weigh, yeah, they're weighing the money. And right. It's, they're yeah. weigh, weighing stacks of bills in order to pay for cups of coffee in Venezuela, and that's an argument in favor of, right, I'm interested in Bitcoin because it's uh, anarcho-capitalism. When you have uh, socialist governance models, uh, there is this um, danger of, uh, of hyperinflation because you're giving people the too much authority. You're giving authority figures and lawmakers and uh, the government too much authority over the lives of the people. So when inflation happens, we all pay for it, right? If you're holding currency and it's being hyperinflated, you pay for it through inflation, right? That, that's yeah. an important Absolutely. Uh, observation to make. So some people transitioned from, in, in some part of their portfolio, transitioned from fiat, you know, US dollars, Japanese yen, um, into Bitcoin because there's this set issuance. Whereas if you give the government all of the power and all of the authority to um, make it so that they can enact their vision of the ideal political situation, then they have free reign over the printing press and they can print up as much fiat currency as they want. And they can justify it by saying, this is for your well-being, right? They can say, this is in order to create a socialist utopia. That's why we're printing up all of this money. So having the set issuance uh, in the blockchain means that you don't have to trust Satoshi Nakamoto not to double the token right. supply of Bitcoin. That's all been uh, taken care of by this protocol that can be audited so that you know what the set issuance is and you don't have to worry about uh, there being um, strange alterations that are set forward by um, you know, people in positions of power. Jerry, have, yeah. you ever heard this, uh, have you ever heard this quote before? I think it's a pretty... Uh, interesting description of maybe the business cycle that a lot of democracies or republics go through. Uh, so it's attributed to Alexander Teitler, although people say he didn't write it. Some people say he did write it or say it, you know, whatever. So I'll, I'll read it now. Uh, it goes, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the people discover that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that the democracy always collapses due to loose fiscal policy. So I, I always thought that was kind of an interesting one. You know, whether it's true or false, you know, it's hard to, hard to say. There's a similar uh, republic. There's a similar quote, uh, in U.S. history, um, there's a similar quote uh, something along the lines of that you need a new revolution every generation, right? Because uh, you start off with people who have a good idea. They create a constitution. It seems to work for the people. But gradually, um, you know, the system is corrupted. So this is the problem with, uh, with people is that we all have our, our vices. We all have uh, ways in which we are um, corrupted by power. So the idea of the blockchain as a trustless system is that you place the trust in certain things like the issuance of the monetary supply uh, in a protocol that cannot be manipulated by human actors, right? Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so basically, uh, um, Barry Silbert says of Ethereum Classic, uh, this is at the blockchain startup Singapore meetup with Milton Demerors. This is a quote by... Uh, Barry Silbert, I've become excited about the people focusing in on Ethereum Classic. You don't have this governance risk where someday someone's going to make a change that goes against the core tenets of investing in cryptocurrency. And the way that I interpret that is the community of Ethereum Classic is interested in having a decentralized governance model in the mold of Bitcoin. And if you look at the history of Bitcoin, it was architected very carefully to be decentralized. 
if Satoshi had started his first post to the message board by saying, hey, everyone, this is Bob Smith of Wounded Knee, Arkansas. I've got a great idea for a new technological platform. And then a few days later, he replied and said, hey, guys, you know, I've thought this through and maybe it would be better if I were, you know, to post under a pseudonym. If from now on you could refer to me as Satoshi Nakamoto, the cat would be out of the bag, right? Right. His very first step had to be as a pseudonym in order to decentralize the network because in the early stages, he was the de facto leader. He was the figurehead. And then as the network became more and more decentralized by having these, uh, the ability for miners to be um, located geographically all over the world, you know, having different philosophical backgrounds, having different uh, economic backgrounds, decentralizing all of these miners to protect the validity, the immutability of the Bitcoin blockchain. Right, then he left. <laughs> then he, yeah, the crowning achievement was he left. And that, <laughs> what allows for Bitcoin to be what I view as being an anarcho-capitalist model because the leaderlessness means that it's uh, anarcho-capitalism. I, I, I have, uh, I have my theory on, on yeah. Satoshi. Yeah. No, I was oh. gonna, can, I, can I just make a comment? So, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So I think what we're all saying, so if, we, if us three, if we decided tomorrow that we're going to have start our own uh, cryptocurrency, clearly we would want to have uh, as uh, little or no centralization, have a cap, have everything spelled out to, to, to grow investor confidence. But um, also, I think what you are saying, you are, you are surmising that the reason that Satoshi stayed anonymous was because it, it, it was to protect his baby, to protect Bitcoin, that it would have been a threat. The investors wouldn't have it wouldn't have been confidence building if they saw this powerful person in well, the community. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jerry. I have my thoughts on that, but go ahead. So um, it was to protect decentralization because Vitalik has been very successful as uh, a figure that inspires inspiration. And this was not the model that Satoshi set out to create, in my opinion. So if you look at the blockchains, I mean, Christian, you were saying if you were to create a, a blockchain, the, the next question is, would you as Christian create a blockchain or would you as a pseudonym create a blockchain? Why was it necessary for Satoshi to be pseudonymous in this uh, enterprise? Now go down the list of blockchains. So who is the godhood figure in charge of Ethereum? It's Vitalik, right? Well, how about Zcash? It's Zuko. How about Waves? It's Sasha. How about Litecoin? It's Charlie. So in each of these situations, you need a strong, powerful figure to represent the blockchain to get investors excited. There's really very few arguably exceptions. There's Bitcoin uh, when Satoshi Nakamoto left, which I think was his plan from the start in order to create a leaderless model. And Definitely. Vitalik left the immutable blockchain uh, we had a very interesting historical precedent of another potentially leaderless model. Yep, I'm about it. So uh, I was also thinking about uh, Satoshi. A, a lot of his Bitcoins haven't moved, correct? At the, the, there's a few addresses. I don't think any of them have. Not, none of them have moved. So, so Satoshi actually, he lost his key and he's really upset. <laughs> I think he burned them. <laughs> Yeah, he just he he lost his keys and he's just got a million, or well, not a million. I don't know how much money that would be right now. I, I, th I think he burned the keys because his goal was not to get rich. His goal was to create a platform that would be viable long term that would allow people an alternative store of value to oh, gold. Man. Yacht. Can't imagine burning burning a key with a million bitcoins on it. <laughs> well, what what would be more rewarding to you, right? I mean, arguably. Would you find it more rewarding to win the lottery and, and make a hundred million dollars, or would you find it more rewarding to be the architect of, uh, you know, arguably, I guess we're pretty biased, but one of the greatest technological revolutions of our time? Both. Uh, <laughs> it would. I would. Um, I would fade into the background, keep my key, and then in the year twenty XX, 
cash them out, have a little bit of a good time. You know? Is that? I mean, that's just me. I think Satoshi uh, burned them, but I mean, oh, man, don't, uh, Jerry, you're hurting me. You're hurting <laughs> my my chest. I feel how it. Many, how, many, uh, how many millions of dollars do you need, though? I mean, shouldn't you put an upper cap on the amount of money you would you would want to possess? I mean, maybe. I, I think, yeah, I, I guess so. He but decided for himself, he had enough cash, and what he needed was to create something that was you know, for uh, the well-being of uh, the human em enterprise. I yeah. feel my heart sinking. <laughs> I'm thinking of a similar... You can email Craig Wright and ask him to send you some of Satoshi's coins. Okay. Be yeah. more than <laughs> no, but an analogy is think about the World Wide Web when Kim Berners-Lee was... Uh, when it was taking off, people said, you should make money off this, you should somehow control it. And he was insistent that he wanted everything to be open source, the protocols to be open. And it Listen, was because of whether, that. whether he has the key or doesn't have the key, it doesn't control it. But it would be <laughs> nice if he had the key. At least I, I'm hoping for him, whether he wants to take all the money and donate it to charity, whatever. But I mean, really, actually, if you think about it, since each Bitcoin is just a representation of electricity, it's almost like if a gold bar is a, a bar of gold, each Bitcoin is like an electricity bar. If he burned those keys, that's a lot of electricity he threw in the garbage. That hurts. A lot of resources. Uh, uh, yeah. No, no, no I don't like the analogy. Work. No, no, no. That analogy. It's more like it's more like he just threw a bunch of random numbers in the garbage. No, which, no, no. Well, what were you going to say, Jerry? Sorry. I think that uh, you know the vision of Bitcoin. Um, to me, it seems conspicuously, uh, as I said, to be an anarcho-capitalist model. So, if he possessed all of those coins he would be in a position of authority that is, you know, unprecedented in, in human history. I mean, there, I guess there's some pretty rich people out there, but um, if you look at what's going on in, in India, uh, just because this was something that uh, happened just a few days before this digital currency group meetup, in India, uh, lawmakers decided without any warning that they would eliminate the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes overnight. Crazy, crazy. And everyone had to take their 500 and 1,000 rupee notes to the bank and deposit them or exchange them for smaller denomination bills. This was done in order to counteract um, counterfeiting, right? In order to prevent against people counterfeiting these high denomination bills, <clears throat> just in order to, um, to have... Uh, Barry's views be uh, showcased a little more on this podcast. He said that this to him is uh, threatening. He used the word uh, terrifying. And he says that um, this is something that the rest of the world is paying very close attention to. So direct quote, I'm not a big believer in holding on to physical cash, Silbert says, but I do believe in privacy. I can assure you that many countries around the world are looking at this experiment in India and assuming it is successful, I believe they are going to follow suit. So there are already talks to eliminate the $100 bill in the United States and there are plans to eliminate the 500 euro bill by the end of 2018. So oh, it, man. it looks like high denomination physical bills are going to be gradually eliminated uh, on a global scale. I've heard wow. that before a long time ago that, well, if you think, and I, I could see the arguments for that. If you think about, okay, there's how many hundred dollar bills are counterfeit, how many are sitting in some drug dealer's basement. And so if you made a rule that said, okay, uh, in the next five years, everybody has to turn in their hundred dollar bills for replacements. The, the nefarious people won't do that. The counterfeit bills obviously won't be turned in. And so it's a way for the United States government to, to, to get a hold of a lot of cash that's floating out there nefariously. It was a clever argument. But. It's, a, it's a technological arms race because as the ability, as, as technology improves that allows people to counterfeit fiat currency, the government needs to respond to that. So right now in India, people are buying lots of Rolex watches as uh, they see it as being, you know, perhaps a way to have a store of value because they, they don't see Rolex watches being, um, 
you know, taken out of circulation. It's a substitution for uh, 1,000 rupee notes, but it's, it's kind of um, uh, crude, right? Especially in comparison with the obvious Bitcoin. replacement. Yeah. yeah, cryptocurrency is basically uh, positioned to replace these high denomination bills. And so the question becomes geographically, which nations are going to say, well, there's too much um, privacy. Uh, you have too many privacy options with these cryptocurrencies. So we need to regulate them out of existence or, or, or uh, crack down on them. And which nations are going to be more welcoming of financial technology because they see it as being a potential boon to their uh, yep. I, I have uh, I have some thoughts on on countries and their willingness to you know use cryptocurrency or blockchains in general and stuff like that um, I, I see it as kind of being like a domino effect um, so the only thing that these countries dislike more than blockchains are their next door neighbors being way better than them and having a better economy and stuff like that. So even if you had say five or six countries say in Africa or, or the Middle East or something like that, they were completely anti-blockchain for whatever reason. All it really takes is one of them to be pro-blockchain and start to reap the benefits of, you know, increased productivity and just, you know, everything would be so much more efficient than their next door neighbors that the rest would follow suit, I think, pretty quickly. At least that's, that's what I think. That's what I hope. You have this uh, historical precedent of automobiles in Europe, don't you? Um, at, the, at the time when, as a technology, people were transitioning from the horse and buggy to the Ford Model T and the, the early yeah. prototype yeah. for automobiles. Um, this goes back to another Andreas talk. There's a, there's a lot of content in there that's very useful from a historical perspective. Apparently, there was some regulation, I believe, applied in Britain that said, we're really concerned about these automobiles. We're concerned about their safety. And so we're going to impose uh, a new law that says that if you have an automobile on the road, you need to have a driver. And then in addition, you need to have someone who's positioned ahead of the automobile, who walks ahead of the automobile and waves a flag in the air in order to hurt people that there's this flaming death mobile on the way and they should be on, you know, red alert. Right. That did not, uh, surprisingly enough, contribute positively to the automobile industry uh, in Europe. Um, the U.S., that, which didn't have this regulation, pulled ahead because, you know, basically the government had hamstrung this industry in its early days, and it was only later that, uh, that Europe managed to catch up, but I believe that the, I'm, I'm uh, remembering this, uh, so you might want to check the, the specifics, but yeah. we do have these historical precedents where one nation or another is, uses regulation to inhibit technological advancement. So we might be seeing something similar. With that's, crypto. that's actually encouraging what you guys said, because if you're, if you, in the back of your mind, if somebody has fears of a coming, you know, war government versus the cryptocurrency enthusiasts and uh, privacy uh, supporters versus the government. If it, it, what you're saying is all the governments or at least the powerful ones that all have to collude to try to uh, ban cryptocurrency and be successful. Yeah. Still though, still though, it, it's almost like a, a government version of a 51% attack. All it takes is one to create this this keeping up with the Joneses scenario where then everybody would switch really quickly, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, really quickly in terms of how quickly move governments move with putting regulation in and taking it out. It wouldn't be like, you know, a day or so, but it, it really wouldn't take that long, I think, after one government is very pro-blockchain for the others to follow suit. I see. Obviously, you'd have the stragglers just like we have, you know, in, in today's world, we have governments that are, are you know, anti-capitalist and, and lag behind, you know, in, in many different categories, I think in the future, you're still going to have the, the people who really stick their feet in the ground and don't want to budge, but there's going to be a ton of pro-blockchain governments just because they want the competitive advantage over their neighbors and they want to be better than them. Yeah. yeah. You're also going to see some 
pro-blockchain innovation uh, within geographical regions that are uh, anti-capitalism as a, as a means of survival, right? Um, so uh, necessity breeds invention, is that the, the phrase? Uh, if you're in Venezuela right now and you're a Bitcoiner, uh, that can be of value to you immensely. If you're in the United States, you know, a lot of people dismiss Bitcoin as being completely irrelevant because they've got this strong uh, national currency that doesn't undergo these, uh, these crises. So I think we'll see some very interesting experiments happening in places where the situation is not so good. And then in terms of startups, it looks like right now, uh, a good place to be is probably Switzerland or Singapore. Those governments seem to want to uh, encourage people to be experimental with their fintech startups. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I think we're going to be seeing a lot of really interesting things happening uh, in high tech Singapore. I think we're going to be seeing some really interesting things happening in, uh, you know, uh, less advantageously situated uh, places out, out of necessity. Yeah, I agree. Um, so uh, I think that about wraps it up for me. I don't know if you have any other questions or anything you want to touch on, Christian? No, no, that was pretty thorough. Yeah, good, great stuff. Jerry? Uh, can, I, uh, can I bring up one more thing? Sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, not to belabor the point, but uh, the thesis that I arrived upon regarding the Ethereum Classic community was that there were, were these three constituent constituencies of the developers, the miners, and the investors, and that these three constituencies should have differing objectives. And I view this as being really important because it is the negotiation between these three groups uh, that provide checks and balances over authoritarian overreach, right? Um, so Definitely. it's useful for people in the community to identify what their objectives are and to communicate with other people who are part of their same camp, it's important for the different camps to negotiate uh, in order to arrive upon ECIPs rather than reverting to uh, ad hominem attacks or other forms of coercion, right? So yeah. if you and I had decided to meet for this podcast and you wanted to meet on a Monday and I wanted to meet on a Wednesday, we have differing objectives, which is fine. That's a natural consequence of um, our being in different positions strategically. We could negotiate to meet on Tuesday. For you, it's a bit late. For me, it's a bit early but we each make concessions in order to arrive upon uh, a conclusion that we both can live with, right? Mm -hmm. Right. The other thing that can occur, of course, is to engage in coercion. So, you know, I call you nasty names or you threaten me or so on and so <laughs> forth. That's an attempt to uh, marginalize the other person's agency. It's a way of taking away from them any potential bargaining chips that you could use in order to arrive on a, on a harmonious solution that, uh, it, that requires concessions. So that's what I'm really concerned about with Ethereum Classic. We don't want anyone strong arming uh, the community. We want a series of checks and balances and we should always be vigilant in identifying behavior that is destructive because there are people who are going to use coercive methods either in or order to self-aggrandize or to make uh, others incapable of being part of the uh, discussion or because they are uh, holding tokens from some other blockchain and they have a vested interest in uh, the Ethereum Classic community being non-competitive. So that I view as being a, a useful framework to think of uh, when um, engaging with the community. Okay. So you'd like to see the, you want, if, uh, just to partially summarize, you'd like to see the community, the different aspects of it, work together uh, cordially and effectively without uh, having to resort to, to, to uh, more undesirable behaviors. So I there are certain people who are miners who are also investors 
because they mine the blockchain and they are saving up tokens. So they occupy more than one camp, but when you ask them about their objectives, mm -hmm. then it's going to be more clear whether their objectives are in alignment with the miners or in alignment with the developers. So a way to subvert the system is to say, uh, oh, hey guys, I'm an investor. Uh, I have lots of tokens, but w in actuality, your objectives are in alignment with the miners and you're just trying to subvert the um, ability of the other camp uh, by posing as um, part of that group. Uh, we need to be honest with each other about which objectives we have and it's just going to be uh, very clear as it scales up that the developers, the miners and uh, the investors have differing objectives and from there you need to negotiate in order to reach ECIPs. And the reason you need to negotiate instead of using coercion is that these three camps are set up like dominoes, right? If one falls, the other fall. So I'm an investor, maybe I'm arguing with the miners, and I come up with some ingenious method of sabotaging the miners. Well, the miners are sabotaged. They all walk, right? They start um, mining some other blockchain. They, they mine Ethereum or they mine Zcash. Well, what does that do to the hash rate? The hash rate drops. Now the developers can't run their dApps. I intentionally sabotaged the miners, and now that's hit the developers, developers can't run their dApps, and suddenly there's no value to the system, the dApps aren't running, the investors sell their tokens, so I've managed to, it boomerangs back on me by sabotaging the miners, the other dominoes fall and it, it boomerangs back on me. That's why there's a necessity for negotiation. It isn't because we all need to be nice people, we need to be intelligent and recognize that our own objectives, reaching those objectives, require the success of the other two constituencies. We either have a virtuous cycle where we reinforce each other, or we have a vicious cycle where sabotage breeds sabotage. Yeah. Very true. It's a tripod. We've got to keep all three legs uh, nice and strong. You said dominoes. I was thinking tripod. That's all. <laughs> that's my, my framework for thinking about the necessity of negotiation. Uh, and when people attack uh, Barry Silbert, which happens fairly frequently within the Ethereum Classic community, the way that I think about that is I view it as a way of basically um, using coercion, right? It's, it's an ad hominem attack in order to strip away the validity of the participation of the investors. And investors like me are particularly, um, I think that we are threatened by the ease with which people can characterize investors as being self, uh, short-term oriented and selfish, right? Mm -hmm. But without the investors investing capital, without people like Barry Silbert going out on a limb, as you mentioned, and Melton Demrors and the Digital Currency Group uh, as an institution, without their going out on a limb and taking risks and saying, we see there being this really good foundation for Ethereum Classic, then there's no value to the tokens, right? If, if, if no investors are investing capital in the token, there's no value to the tokens. That means the miners can't pay their, their bills if they're mining the blockchain and it means no, no dApps will run on the blockchain. So the investors have a legitimate uh, role, the miners have a legitimate role, the developers have a legitimate role. We're working together and ad hominem attacks against any one of these constituencies, especially by targeting the most influential members of any constituencies, I view as being a method of uh, counteracting negotiation by using ad hominems as uh, a form of coercion, if that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense to me. And uh, I agree. That's why, uh, you know, I think we all do, or most people do a pretty good job of keeping the debates and discussions civil, which is pretty awesome. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. 
Um, so uh, anything else you want to you wanna touch on, Christian or Jerry? No, I'm good. That's it for me. Okay, excellent. So, uh, Jerry, thanks for um, joining us tonight. Absolutely. Um, thanks for joining me and Christian on this. We'd love to have you on again sometime. We're kind of going through um, different aspects of the community, the, the miners, the devs. Uh, now we've had, you know, from an investor perspective on, so we're going to have a lot of different guests as the in the, the the weeks going forward but we'd love to have you on again sometime absolutely my pleasure looking forward to it. excellent all right take care guys great speaking with you